Okay, uh, I'm going to introduce you now if that's all right. Um, so uh, welcome back for the uh, final uh, Slack Snap seminar uh, of this academic year. And as our final speaker, we have uh, Asaf Zivi, uh, who is a professor and holder of the Kravitz Chair at the Graduate School of Business in Columbia. Um, he's uh, interested in, uh, you know, he's worked pretty much across the piece in operations, research, statistics, and machine learning. So he's worked in various queuing models, uh, sequential learning, and also a lot of uh, revenue maximization work. So he's, he's got a pretty broad set of interests. Uh, he's found his work has found applications in online retail, retail, healthcare, dynamic pricing, recommendation systems, social learning in online marketplaces. Uh, he did his BSc and MSc in the Technion and subsequently a PhD in Stanford University. Uh, he spent time as a visitor in Stanford, the Technion and Tel Aviv University. Uh, he's had several awards, including uh, a career award from the NSF, an IBM faculty award, Google Research Award, uh, and uh, several uh, best paper awards, including the, including the 2019 Mas uh, Lancaster Prize. Um, he's also uh, been uh, done a lot of service to the community, particularly being uh, the editor-in-chief of Stochastic Systems, and he raised on the editorial board of uh, a number of uh, journals in the operations research and uh, machine learning and revenue management uh, communities. So it's great to have Asaf here uh, giving a talk, so thank you very much, and he's going to be talking about uh, structured learning in sequential selection, so thank you. Thanks a lot, Neil. Can you guys hear me? Just uh, make sure that the audio is fine. Okay, perfect. Uh, thanks. So uh, thanks for the um, very kind, uh, too generous of an introduction. Uh, next time I know when you ask for a bio, I'll send a much more diluted version. And, you know, I have like a boilerplate bio that I send out that I've learned my lesson now. So, uh, but thank you for the generous intro and it's uh, really great to, to be here. Uh, the, also nice to see so many familiar names, if not faces on the... Um, um, you know, list of participants. So, hi to everyone that I that I know, uh, as well as as well as those that I don't know. But uh, certainly nice to see also familiar familiar people there. Uh, I'll talk about this work on um, structured learning and sequential selection. Hopefully, it sort of is of um, some interest to the to this community. Uh, it's, so there are bits and pieces here based on work that are that have been done with multiple co-authors. So it's really there. Their contribution much more much more than mine. So let me give some motivation for this uh, for this work. Like, what where am I coming from with this? So, um, generally speaking, my um, my sense of um, like the problems that are of interest to me are lying somewhere in the intersection of OR and, and machine learning and. And in, in OR, the traditional work, uh, including a lot of the work in, in queuing theory, is to start off with a model and to build around that um, some decision-making mechanism, usually you know, harnessing dynamic programming techniques, optimal control, et cetera. And the machine learning community, which is also, a, or a machine learning area, which is an area that I dabble in, uh, that area focuses more on and algorithmic uh, approaches. That is, uh, you know, algorithms are designed to solve problems without a lot of model structure, but at the same time, without also relying on problem primitives, which is typically what we do when we uh, <clears throat> try to follow the more traditional OR approach. Uh, uh, having said that, in, in recent years, there's been a lot of interest, I think, in our broad community to, to study problems where there's more uncertainty on the parametric structure of the problem or model uncertainty more generally and how that can be incorporated into, into decision making and, and control, uh, et cetera. And that's more or less my, my area of interest. It will be reflected also in this, in this talk. So it's essentially a question of how to synergize some of these approaches between these, um, these two fields. And in particular, uh, one problem which is of interest to me and will be reflected to some extent in this um, in this presentation is how to leverage problem structure. So a lot of problems that we study, there's a lot of special structure that um, that is involved there. And in fact, again, for those of you at least who are you know originating in uh, queuing theory, you know that a lot of the big advances they were made based on specific problem structure that allows a much more elegant and, and more effective uh, analysis. So how to leverage problem structure and design solutions that are uh, more like custom-built learning algorithms. So it's the 
the machine learning objectives, but it's more leveraging problem structure than what is typically done in the machine learning community. Uh, to give an illustrative example of what's a type of uh, problems where you can exploit structure. So uh, there is um, a very commonly studied problem is uh, related to the design of recommender systems, which are widely used across many uh, many companies in the tech landscape. Like if you look at the, I mean, Amazon, Netflix, uh, you know, music streaming services, Google, in fact, is like, again, a massive recommendation engine. Uh, all of these problems deal with um, a very, typically very high dimensional space of items that you're looking to recommend to users. And the problem is that you're only going to rec recommend a subset of that. So then in this example, I'm showing um, headphones on Amazon. And there, there's an enormous number of, uh, of these items. I was actually shocked myself to find that this is uh, in the tens of thousands. I, I was guessing like hundreds maybe, but it's in the tens of thousands uh, of uh, this particular item. And then the question is when you're gonna show this to a user, whether it's on a computer screen or, or on, a, on a phone and the Amazon app, uh, you can only show a very limited number of these items. So there's a problem of selection out of that uh, very large space of possible alternatives. And how do you do that selection? And that leads to problems of um, substitution because all these products are, you know, to a first order, they're substitutable. So how do you make that selection? This is the same problem that you see with, um, with uh, you know, the movie recommender system in Netflix. Uh, um, the only reason I put this up is because it took me forever to play around with my Netflix account to actually get some of my favorite movies in the critically acclaimed movies. So I, I did like, you know, 25 iterations to finally get those four four movies up there. So I know if some of you don't don't haven't seen the movies and don't appreciate it, that's fine. But I felt a sense of achievement and being able to get the recommender system to do it. So that's uh again a problem which is very prevalent. And uh it for um from an OR perspective, this is something that has been been studied, this um this whole notion of um product substitution, dynamic substitution, et cetera. And a very common parametric framework to, to study this is to use something like the multinomial choice model that you're seeing here, which is essentially the probability of choosing an item is given by this ratio of uh, exponential to the sum of exponentials all parameterized by this vector theta. So there's a simple parametric structure that shows how consumers choose among the, among the products. And then if you're looking to maximize revenue, for example, which is a typical objective in these settings, then you have this, um, this product space N, you have a set of uh, possible sub choices, which you're going to actually show uh, K. And then the problem is a combinatorial problem of choose K out of N, uh, the subset K, such that you maximize the revenue uh, extracted from that bundle that you're showing. And that's that summation that you see here with the RKs being the marginal product revenues. And the probability here is a probability that you choose an item K if what you're showing is the particular subset calligraphic K. And then again, you're maximizing over these bundles. So this formulation goes back like almost 20 years now, I think, um, to the initial work that was mostly done by um, uh, Garrett Van Ryzen and various co-authors. And I should add here that uh, I'm gonna be treating the literature here very sparingly. So if you're looking, this talk is a way to really get into literature. There's not going to be a lot of citations. Uh, here and there, I sprinkle a few, but if I omit specific literature that any of you are involved with, uh, don't be offended. You're in good company. <laughs> so this um, this uh, benchmark that you're seeing here, this revenue benchmark, which is parameterized by theta, can typically be used or referred to as a full information benchmark. If you're in a situation where you don't know the parameters, which is for all practical purposes, all situations, we almost never know the parameters. You could still use this, think about this as an oracle, and you, you use this as a benchmark. If you knew the parameters, this is the best you could possibly do. And in the case, by the way, of the multinomial logic, just as a side comment, uh, because it has specific structure that can be exploited um, in the optimization problem, it ends up being, although it's a combinatorial problem, there's a lot of special structure that it could be exploited so you can um, solve it from a computational perspective, at least it's uh, something which is which is doable. Whereas if you look at other choice models, you may not be in that type of situation. That's one of the reasons the multinomial logic is so commonly used. So 
it, with the knowledge of the parameters, you have a benchmark. You can treat that as uh, as something that you um, you compare against for any learning algorithm that you superimpose on the problem. Now, if you take uh, if you take the more computer science machine learning perspective on this, this looks like a multi arm bandit problem because you're basically trying to select among all these all these products. Think about each uh, each of these assortments, bundles as, as an arm in that space. And then you need to experiment with the various bundles to see what which one is giving you the highest uh, return. The problem, of course, is uh, that in this type of problem, there is a combinatorial, very large number of such, uh, of such subset selections that you can make. And that's gonna be problematic for implementing this algorithm because the performance of banded type algorithms degrade with a number of options, number of arms. So there are ready-made algorithms for this. Um, uh, UCB refers to upper confidence bound algorithms and Thompson sampling is the Bayesian type algorithm, which has become very common today, mostly in industry implementations. So these are common ways to solve the problem. But again, because the product space is very large, think about the headphone problem. 30,000 uh, is the nominal set. And then you can choose maybe subsets of size, maybe on the order of eight. So if you're looking at the combinatorial aspects of the problem, that's the number of arms, so to speak. It's very, very large. So it's not very effective to just use these algorithms um, over the counter without any customization. So the idea is that uh, if you're implementing this like that, that's not a good way to start. A uh, better way is to exploit some of, some structure in the problem. That's where the, the choice model uh, structure starts to play, play a role. And you can maybe exploit that. Uh, and build, again, custom solutions uh, that, again, maybe they're specific to the multinomial logic case, but they at least illustrate that you can solve this problem effectively as opposed to just, you know, staring down this uh, exponentially exponential number of alternatives, which is not going to be effective. So it turns out, despite the problem being very widely encountered in practice, it's only fairly recently that uh, there the first um, more definitive algorithm was was laid out um, a couple of years ago that essentially is can, can be shown to have near optimal performance. And this algorithm essentially exploits this uh, structure that exists in the multinomial logic also for the purpose of designing the actual learning algorithm. So this algorithm was a, a customization of the upper confidence bound algorithm to this specific setup and showed that you can achieve Near optimal performance means that essentially no other algorithm can achieve uh, performance which is better. And this is uh, all measured relative to that full information benchmark that I put up a couple of slides ago. So you can get reasonably close to that benchmark. The reasonably close is quantified through what we call regret bounds and those regret bounds are nearly optimal. So that was the first illustration of this customization idea. And it turns out that indeed in the case of the multinomial logic because of the extra structure there, you don't have this um, exponential complexity. So the complexity actually only grows linearly with the uh, number of products, which is still a fairly large constant, but not, not as bad. And this algorithm was then modified to, um, to also sort of adjusted to the Thompson sampling setting, so which is more common in practice. Uh, the reason for that is because it's less conservative relative to, uh, to UCB. Uh, and each one of these algorithms, the customization is actually built on very different principles. So it's not that you can't just sort of co copy paste what was done for UCB and apply it in Thompson sampling, which actually requires a completely different set of design ideas to customize Thompson sampling. But alg that algorithm is actually used in, in practice. So I'm aware at least of uh, two implementations of the algorithm uh, that was proposed in that, in that paper, which is, uh, again, not not as is, but you know, built upon the ideas in that, in that paper, which are implemented in actual recommender systems. So this is something that is uh, essentially can be translated also to the level of being deployed in, in practice and uh, again, computationally efficient manner. And, and this um, line of work have introduced this idea of uh, a structured bandit problem or MNL bandit. MNL stands for multinomial logic. So again, this is an illustration of this idea that you can exploit problem structure to design more, um, I don't wanna say clever, but more effective learning algorithms that are 
uh, targeting solutions, which are otherwise, again, generic, if you approach with generic algorithms are not gonna be very, very effective. So that's the motivation, essentially. That's what I have in mind, like taking this problem structure and basically using it as a, as a guideline to improving learning algorithms. So this is where the main part of the talks uh, starts. It, you can see um, on, the, on the bottom, I have a counter for slides. Uh, so don't, don't be too worried about the number 32. I'm not married to that number. So there are lots of exit points in the, in the talk. If we exhaust time earlier, then the, we'll find one of those exit points and just uh, depart from that. So I'm not you know, gonna you know, be shoving all 32 slides down your throat. So what are the goals of this, uh, of this talk? I wanna show you a slightly more detailed example. This was a really high level hand-waving example. I wanna show you a slightly more detailed example uh, of a sequential selection problem. In fact, two problems from sequential selection. You can think about them as two, two vignettes, uh, one of them being an optimal stopping problem and one of them being a sequential stochastic assignment problem. Both are actually uh, close relatives. Uh, and we'll see that some of the design principles actually also repeat themselves between the two problems. And these problems will illustrate that by <clears throat> looking at problem structure, you can be more um, effective in the design of, of learning algorithms. And again, it's important to at this point also make the disclaimer that I'm going to provide very little in terms of like math arguments or real theorems. I'll just try to give like a high level set of ideas um, just so people can sort of walk away with a sense of what this, um, what are the salient points here and what you can really, what I define as structure in these problems. And not a lot of literature review as I already mentioned earlier. So the, there are two vignettes, there's not that much time. So I'm gonna do um, an allocation of time, which is gonna be roughly the following. So um, uh, the first vignette is gonna be relatively short. So like a speed drive through that vignette. And then we'll go to the second one, which is gonna be a little bit, a little bit longer and more detailed, but we may exit that because of time constraints. So the first vignette is an optimal stopping problem. This is a classical problem in, in OR. So you have a, a single item that's being sold or, or auctioned off. Uh, there are bids that arrive sequentially. There's a finite horizon of length N that will be fixed throughout the, throughout the talk. So there's a length of the game, which is, which is N, in which we're playing this. And then the objective here is to design algorithms that stop this sequence to maximize the value of the selected bid. This is what I think was initially called the house selling problem or something of, of sort. And the problem has a long history. I'll mention something about it in a second, but uh, it's important to understand this game is played in a way that once the sequence is stopped, then there's no recourse, the game terminates. So you select that one bid that you want and that's it, then the game is basically over. You can't look back and take something which is better uh, and you can't continue going forward also. And the question is how to design algorithms when there's not a lot known about the bids. So the problem when there's full information on the bids is very well studied, but the problem when there's no information or less information on the bids is uh, studied to a much lesser degree. So the first take on this, uh, you can think about, again, slightly formalizing it, uh, think about a sequence uh, of random variables, IID from an unknown distribution. And the question is how to design this uh, stopping rule. Uh, tau that approximately maximizes that uh, that expectation. So you have an expectation of the bid, if you wish, or the value of the random variable that you're you're taking, which is determined by the stopping time, and you're trying to maximize that. Of course, you don't know the distribution, so you you can't actually compute this object. But you know, if you if you had an oracle that told you what that value is, then this would be the the target value you want to compare against. So think about that as the full information benchmark, just like in that, uh, in that uh, recommender system problem. And this has a long and storied history. It goes back to the work of Cayley. This is the mathematician from the Cayley-Hamilton theorem, for those of you who recall linear algebra. And it went through various names, which is almost like the list of all the who and who in the OR community at the time. Uh, with th these are some of the first definitive entries, at least in this um, in this line of work. And, and again, it's a very classical problem. If, if the distribution is known, 
Uh, this is a classical problem. You will find it in a lot of uh, DP textbooks, like uh, as a homework problem, uh, just to exercise on writing the Bellman equation and finding what the recursion looks like in a specific case of distributions. Now, the, the problem again is if you have that objective and, and you don't know the distribution, it's sort of useless objective because you can't actually compute it in any way. Uh, a more uh, a step towards a more realistic objective would be to approximate that objective by looking at the maximum in hindsight. So imagine that you had observed all the all the random variables and you picked the largest one given that sequence. Then the idea would be to try to find a stopping time that would make the value of that expectation of x close to the expected value of the max in hindsight. This idea of looking at the best in hindsight solution is very common in a lot of um, a lot of the machine learning literature. So those of you who are familiar with that literature probably have seen it quite a bit. And you, you'll see that it's going to play an important role in what I'm going to show you also uh, today in this in this talk. So uh, this is, uh, uh, again, a sort of an important idea of shifting the objective from the what would be sort of the DP solution, uh, only you don't know the distribution, to the um, solution of looking at the best in hindsight. So can we, uh, can we get something that actually does that? Can, can, can we get a stopping rule that doesn't know the distribution, but can somehow still get that expectation to be approximately uh, close to this uh, max in hindsight and expectation. So it turns out there's uh, an interesting uh, separating hyperplane here between the types of distributions and what you can, you, can, you can and cannot achieve. So in particular, if the class of distributions is, uh, is heavy-tailed, and again, I won't be too specific about the um, heavy-tailed, light-tailed, et cetera, uh, but you can think about sort of the textbook definition of uh, heavy tail here. Uh, think about like Pareto like distributions. Then uh, the answer is no. Uh, you can't get that um, approximate equality to hold. And you can you can make that rigorous by showing that there is a gap between the left hand side and right hand side, which can't be closed essentially. But if the distributions are light tailed or have finite support, so think about like a Gaussian or like a uniform as uh, representative members of those classes of distributions? And the answer is yes. You can actually design algorithms that are oblivious to the underlying distribution and actually achieve that approximate equality. And again, to make that rigorous, it would mean that the left-hand side and right-hand side have a gap. The gap obviously works in favor of the max in hindsight, but that gap basically diminishes as the problem horizon gets large. So think about this as in that asymptotic framework, uh, you can get something which basically um, closes down that, that gap. And in fact, you can refine this by showing that there exist algorithms, again, that don't know the distribution, but yet are able to achieve this thing in a way that is actually close to best possible or close to uh, minimax optimal, meaning that if you think about this as a game between the algorithm designer and nature, then algorithm designer declares the algorithm, the stopping rule, and nature picks the worst possible distribution within that admissible class. So let's think about the class of light-tailed or finite support distributions where there is some hope of doing something. Nature picks the worst possible distribution there for that specific algorithm. And yet, despite that, the results that are achieved are still very good. Uh, and that's due to the fact that the algorithms are very robust to the underlying distribution. And you'll see in what sense they're robust also a bit later in the talk. So I'll show the other vignette in more detail and you'll see what that robustness actually really means, uh, both in terms of the theory and also in terms of some numerical illustrations that I have. So that's the general, uh, the general flavor of um, what we're trying to achieve with this, with this problem. Um, what's interesting about the structure of the algorithm is it doesn't try to approximate the DP solution. What I mean by that is that it's not a algorithm that operates on a plug-in principle, which is uh, gather some initial observations, like wait for some of the bids to come in uh, and, and don't take them obviously, and use them to calibrate a distribution and then plug that into the, to the DP 
and from that point and on, basically play the DP or maybe update the distribution as you move along and also update your DP uh, accounting for the residual horizon. That's not that's not at least the algorithms that we can show results for. Maybe it's possible, but uh, I'll show you later that there are some potential potential pitfalls with that type of approach. So it's not an estimate and then optimize type of uh, solution, which is very common again in learning problems. And uh, in contrast to that, it actually does rely on structural properties of the problem. So what are those structural properties? Again, I'll show you in a bit in more in more detail, but that's the important theme that I'm trying to get across that you can exploit the, the problem structure to design these algorithms in, in a more clever way. What's interesting here also is that there is not a lot of work on this problem. So this, um, this problem that I'm mentioning at the top of the slide, which is trying to analyze this quantity, which is um, maximizing the expected value of X when you don't know the distribution and have to design the stopping rule, Although there is a lot of literature in the case where the distribution is known, there's hardly any literature in the case where the distribution is, is unknown. And that was one of the reasons that, that we, together with the co-authors, uh, felt it was an interesting problem to, to study. Uh, and in particular, the type of entries in the literature that you see are mostly using very specific structure. Like if it's a uniform distribution, without knowing the right endpoint, then how can you solve this? And in those specific instances, you could actually use a more uh, DP-oriented approach. And most of the approaches are like that. They basically embed this in a Bayesian framework and then use that to formulate a DP type of solution. But these are very, very specific instances uh, for which you can do it, which require a lot of uh, structure on the underlying distributions. As you see, the flavor of the results on this slide are very general. Like the distributions, classic distributions, is anything that's light-tailed. I think of anything that has a moment generating function around zero or something like that. So um, it's not doesn't require any parametric structure. So the classical example would be something like a Gaussian, but uh, it could be anything for that for that matter that satisfies that requirement without any um, more knowledge on the parametric structure. So that's again like a slightly enhanced flavor of what we're trying to to do with uh, with structured learning, and now I'll sort of say a bit more about the um, about the other problem where I can say I can give a bit more detail and and uh, explain this a bit more also with some more mathematical constructs. Uh, so all, all everything up till now is like motivation, like a little bit of a snippet about what things look like. Now we're going to get into a little bit more a little bit more details. Um, just another comment maybe on this problem. Like if you think about, uh, I, I mentioned that the algorithms are not estimate and optimize uh, type algorithms. If you think about the structure, the DP structure here, imagine that you have, um, for example, distribution like uniform zero one, and you're looking at the structure of the DP solution. Then what does the DP solution look like in these types of problems? So you start off uh, with a threshold, which is very high. All the random variables are zero, one, obviously. So you start off with a threshold that's very high, very close to one, because you don't want to take the initial bids that you see, the initial random variables that you see coming in. And as you move along the sequence, uh, you, you basically adjust for that, uh, for that threshold. And uh, the threshold essentially in the case of, um, of a uniform distribution, if you actually do the calculations of the, the DP, you can see that the threshold behaves roughly like one minus one by N. So if N is the problem horizon, then one minus one by N is roughly the threshold behavior. So you start off um, very close to one, and then you start shaving off as you move along because eventually you wanna, you wanna pick something. You can't keep the threshold to be very high. And if it would be an infinite horizon discounted problem, then that threshold actually would be uh, a single threshold, which depends on the discount factor. So that, that would be the classical solution. And then the idea of how you exploit that structure, again, will become more clear in the second vignette, but that's what we're basically talking about. We know what the sequence of thresholds looks like, uh, and that's the thing that we can try to exploit in building the, the learning algorithm. Okay, so this is the part where I want to give a little bit more more details because I'll speak a bit more on the both both the mathematical structure and also I'll give some numerical illustrations. So uh, here you have again a problem horizon of length n, 
and there are um, items, call them jobs, that arrive sequentially, and each such job has some stochastic property associated with it. And these properties are independent across the jobs. And then there are recipients. Uh, in the original paper that introduced this, they're called workers. So think about the, the again, more generically as re recipients that basically wait for these items to be assigned to them. And each such entity, worker, for the sake of the terminology we're using here, has some innate ability to perform the job. And these abilities are all known in advance and deterministic. That's the a layout of the problem. And I'll mention in a second what's the origin of the problem. So I'm just adopting the, the terminology and the layout that was introduced in the original paper that spoke about this structure. And then the game is played as follows. Upon arrival, each job needs to be assigned to the worker. Once it's assigned, you basically scratch both the job and the worker off the list and move on. So this is a process of sequentially assigning these jobs to the workers. And once that assignment is made, there's some reward which is generated based on the notion of quality of the assignment, which we'll again make more precise in a second. That's a high level description of what this, uh, what this problem is. I mean, for those of you who know the matching literature, um, online matching in particular, it's very close to that in spirit. I'll mention a connection to that in a second, but this is again, capturing much of that, of that flavor. And the objective is to design online algorithms that assign this arriving sequence to maximize cumulative reward. Again, the rewards are based on this quality of the assignment and all of that will be spelled out in a second. This problem uh, dates back about 50 years. It was formulated by this paper by Derman, Lieberman, and Ross. Um, was referred to there as the sequential stochastic assignment problem. A lot of follow-up work uh, since. Again, I'm being sparing in literature citations here. And uh, it actually lends itself, or maybe has sort of received even more attention in recent years because of the design of ma many modern uh, marketplaces that are based on these types of ideas. So if you think about something in the spirit of the worker and task idea, which was the terminology introduced in the Durman, Lieberman, Ross paper, uh, you can look at platforms like TaskRabbit, and there are a whole bunch of them and under different names in the US and other countries as well. It's very common across many, uh, many um, um, countries that you'll see that have the, this type of uh, platform that does uh, assignment of uh, work to workers. And there you basically have a platform where there are independent contractors and there are people who come in and have uh, submit work requests. So for example, if I want to move my office here um, at Columbia to a different room and Columbia doesn't actually do it for me, then I'll go to TaskRabbit and I say, I have like this small move I need to do. Uh, it includes, you know, two cabinets, a uh, desk, a computer, blah, blah, blah. And then there are gonna be small boutique moving companies that basically like, uh, you know, the, the one of them in New York is called uh, two guys in a van or something like that. They basically are doing exactly these types of things. So, uh, and TaskRabbit is a platform that basically does the, the assignment. And the typical objective there is to, uh, again, do this matching in a way that tries to maximize revenue satisfaction, depending on various um, various specific structure in that platform. Uh, there are some variation in what the objective is, but broadly, that's the, that's the idea. Uh, this model, if you're looking for an application in, in our community, uh, to an area which is quite important. Uh, there's uh, these papers that were written by um, Chua Ming Su and uh, Stefano Zinius at Stanford that talk about the kidney transplant exchange. And in their, in their setting, the jobs are kidneys, the workers are recipients, and the idea is to assign the kidneys to the recipients waiting on the transplant line. So the idea is that you uh, you know all the characteristics of the recipients because you have your medical medical history and other characteristics as well. And for the quote unquote jobs or the kidneys that arrive, they arrive all of a sudden into this uh, queue to be assigned and they, they have stochastic characteristics, which is related again to the nature of the kidney, the donor, all sorts of other uh, clinical characteristics that are carried in there. Uh, in this paper, they basically treat this problem from the standpoint of, again, knowing the problem primitive. So suppose you know the 
kidneys are have uh, some attributes that are um, stochastic, but coming from a known distribution, how do you make this assignment process work? And this is the little bit of connection to the uh, online matching, um, just to give you a sense of the type of results. This is typically in the um, bipartite graph setting uh, where you have uh, vertices that are known to the decision maker and those that arrive sequentially need to be matched to the original set. And again, there are typ typical results that show you what's the degradation that you get doing it online versus doing it uh, the best offline. So think about best offline as that best in hindsight that we'll be discussing as a benchmark momentarily. But there's a fair amount of literature, literature in this area as well, but it's not directly related to the results that I'm going to show you uh, today. So let me formulate the problem just to explain what we're actually what we're actually trying to target here. So this is a slightly more refined mathematical uh, formulation as opposed to all the hand waving and the workers and jobs and recipients and whatnot. So you observe sequentially random variables x1 through xn coming from a distribution f, and you have assignment rewards which are think about them just as being ordered for simplicity r1 through rn. And you have a policy which essentially assigns at each point in time one of the rewards to one of the observations. And once that reward is assigned, it's, it can't be used anymore. Again, this game is, uh, is played in this manner. You assign the reward to the random variable and both are removed from the game. Now you have n minus one of these left in the game and you proceed. And this uh, policy is obviously adapted to the observations that you see. It's not allowed to peek into the future, the usual, usual restrictions. And you, you allow, if you need any extra randomization to execute the policy, you're allowed to do that as well. And then the objective is to maximize the following. So this is where I'm start, starting to get a bit more specific on what the quality of the match is and what's the actual objective. So you, you take this expectation, uh, it's over the sum of um, index running from one to N. This is the time index, like at every point in time, you're assigning a reward to a random variable and the quality or the reward that you're getting ultimately to accumulate in that sum is just the inner product, just R times X. So this is the structure of the, of the reward. And this is just copy paste from the paper that I mentioned earlier. So this is exactly their, their formulation. Uh, and you're trying to maxima maximize that overall possible assignments with foreknowledge of the distribution F. So call this opt index by N, which is the horizon, and F, which is the key driver here, which is the distribution. That's the, that's the problem. And the solution to that, not surprisingly, given the structure, is you can basically get this through uh, dynamic programming. Um, what is the structure of the solution? So it's a partition policy. You take the, this is all, these are all scalars. So you just take the extended realign and partition it using these uh, sequence of values, um, A with a double subscript there. And uh, essentially what you do is uh, for the arriving um, X, the random variable, you just find which one of those intervals X falls into. And based on where that, what the index of that interval is, you assign it to the appropriate uh, reward value. So the rewards are ordered from small, small to large. And, and the sequence of, um, of thresholds that generate this partition of the extended realign are obtained through this recursion that you see below, which is this integral equation. And you can see the main drive, the driver there, of course, is the, unknown, is the distribution F, which is known in this case. And another interesting aspect that you'll notice here is that the rewards actually don't play a role. The vector of rewards R doesn't play a role in the structure of these intervals. The only thing that plays a role there is the, um, is the distribution F. So the rewards are just ordered, that's it. But uh, the actual uh, values of the rewards do not, do not play a role here. Now, when you're done with the first step, you have this partition. You find where the X falls, you assign the R, then you scratch that random variable. There are N minus one left that you haven't seen yet. There are N minus one rewards left, but now you need to update your partition. So there's a step where you update your partition now 
uh, and then the next X comes in. So the partition isn't fixed in advance, and then you just start wiping out intervals and continue with the same other intervals. Rather, you have to update the entire partition, and then you look at the next X, et cetera. But all of this can be generated in advance. You can just generate all these partitions uh, uh, once before the game starts, since you know the distribution F, and that's it. Uh, and it turns out that the uh, if you think about these partitions then as having some kind of pyramid structure, then the lowest uh, row in that pyramid, when you take the inner product with the rewards, basically gives you the value of the game, which is again sort of typical in, in DP programs. So this is uh, this is the value of opt. And I'll, I'll illustrate that now just a bit more visually so that you have a sense of what's going on. So this is this pyramid, this triangular array, if you wish. This is this bottom most line, which gives you the value of the DP. And that's the first partition that you actually use. That's why I use the second index there in the subscript as N, meaning that this is the one that we're sort of starting off with. When we have N random variables waiting to arrive, the first arrives, I see where it falls, I make the assignment, I scratch that, then I move up one row, in the pyramid and repeat. And I move up, 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 up until I get to a point where the this one is basically just dividing the real line into two segments, minus infinity to that value and that value to plus infinity. And wherever the X falls, I assign it. And then the ultimate assignment is just done because there's no more decisions to make. So that's the, that's the general structure here. And as I said, opt is basically determined by that lowest mo most uh, row in the triangular array. Just take that inner product with the Rs, and that's the that's the value of the of the DP. So just to make it even a little bit more concrete, consider an example where all these X's are uniform zero one. So I'll take an example of three three such um, X's. So what does the pyramid structure look like? So these numbers on this row are just used to compute the optimal value. So that's here. And it doesn't matter again what the Rs are. Whatever they are, that's the optimal value. And then uh, here you can see the first row which we're actually using for our assignment policy. So if uh, a random variable arrives and falls into the interval 0, 3, 8, then it gets the lowest of the reward values. And if it falls into five eighths to one, it gets the highest of the reward values. I assign that one, that's gone. I have two, two left coming in. Then I move up one row in the pyramid, it's one half. So basically now the next random variable comes in. If it's larger than a half, I assign it to the larger of the remaining rewards. If it's less than a half to the lesser of the two. And the last step of the assignment is predetermined. So that's an illustration of how this um, DP solution looks like. And there's a reason I'm coloring these values one half and five eighths. You'll see that in a second because I'm going to draw a connection between this problem and the previous vignette that I talked about, which was the optimal stopping problem. So in particular, what's that connection? So if you consider uh, the situation where the reward vector is artificially set to be all zeros in, in a single one, then maximizing this inner product, the expectation of this inner product of the reward and the X's means just selecting the largest X. So this essentially nests within it the optimal stopping problem. Although this connection, again, somehow is not very visible in the antecedent literature, this is exactly the way you map it into the optimal stopping problem or vice versa. So essentially this is equivalent to maximizing the value of X overall stopping rules. You just basically pass, 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 pass. The pass is assigning zeros. You're not accumulating anything for that. And then at some point you basically pull the trigger and you assign the reward of one. And that means you're selecting the largest variable. Okay, so that's a, just a side comment on this. Uh, and then if you actually think about a simple example where you have uh, a game with two stages, again, uniform zero one for simplicity, then the optimal rule here is very simple. You stop if the first one, come, the first random variable is larger than a half. And if it's less than a half, you continue and just take the second one. So this is the optimal stopping problem solution. Again, this is uh, the matter of like 
two integrals uh, that you compute to get this uh, the structure of the solution. And the value of that uh, of that is five eight. So that's the best you can do if you know that it's uniform and you're solving the optimal stomping problem. The opt value is five eight. And if you look at these numbers, the half, which is a threshold value, the policy, and the five eight, which is the value of the um, of the DP, then flipping back to that earlier pyramid, that's exactly you can see it sort of nested within here. Because that problem, essentially, when you look at the special case of that reward vector, since the solution doesn't depend on the reward vector, you're in these two rows. And that's exactly the one half that you see here, which is determining whether to stop or not. And this is the 5 eighths, which is the value of the problem. So keep in mind, again, that's the when you multiply by the vector of all zeros and one, this is what you pick up. All right, so that's a, just on the connection between the optimal stopping and the, and the assignment problem. So now let's move on from the full information setting where we know the distribution and now what happens when we don't know the distribution. So in this case, uh, we're trying to design a policy that has this characteristic similar to what we saw in the optimal stopping case, which is trying to make that um, expectation of that inner product close to what opt would be. And like the optimal stopping problem, we can't compute opt here because we don't know the distribution. Uh, and like the optimal stopping problem, we're thinking of replacing this by some best in hindsight criteria or optimal offline solution. What is the equivalent in the case of this um, sequential stochastic assignment problem? So in the case of the optimal stopping it was pretty obvious, just take the max, but what is it here? It turns out that if you think about this intuitively, it's not very surprising. If you have a set of uh, numbers and, and another set of numbers, you're know, trying to maximize the inner product, it makes sense that you just arrange the two in ascending order and take that inner product. And that should maximize the, the assignments. And that's essentially the content of this uh, little lemma called the rearrangement lemma that's taken out of this. Uh, I think the earliest point where I could find this lemma mentioned is the uh, book, this celebrated book by Hardy, Littlewood, and Polya on inequalities. So you'll find it there. That's the title of Rearrangement Lemma. So you have two sequence of numbers, and the intuition that I mentioned is precisely capturing out of all the permutations, what's the one that maximizes the inner product? It's obtained by just arranging the two sets of numbers in, in ascending order and then taking the inner product. So, so if that's a solution, if you know all the Xs and you know all the rewards, of course, then you, you'll want to do something like this. So this is essentially an upper bound on, on the DP value. You, the, you can't do better than this, just like you can't do better than the max in hindsight. So this would be the equivalent of the max in hindsight. And what the interesting thing here is that it brings forward this problem structure that I was referring to, which is you can see that what's playing a role here are the order statistics among the Xs. And this is what eventually you can exploit for the purpose also of a learning algorithm. So this objective already starts to shine a light on a particular structure uh, through the use of this best offline solution and how that can be exploited possibly in a learning algorithm. So before we're just talking about that, what's the more mathematical notion of, uh, of performance. So typically in these learning problems, you think about regret and regret is basically indexed by the horizon of play N and the distribution F, which is unknown. And then you look at the difference between uh, the target value. Uh, it could be the DP, but we argue that the DP is not very helpful because we can't compute it anyway. So you can take this and compare it to that. So that's the best offline solution. And that's what whatever you get from your policy, you measure that discrepancy and that's gonna be the, the regret. And then if you wanna design policies that are robust, minimax regret is a suitable way to look at things where you view this as a game between nature and the algorithm designer. You declare the algorithm, nature picks the worst possible distribution and you try to characterize a saddle point of this, of this game. And the typical question is, what's the order of the minimax regret and what's the algorithm that nearly achieves it if that's possible? Those are like the, the two key questions, I guess, in these types, of, uh, these types of problems. So if we start off with the, uh, with the DP solution, then again, uh, we could try to, try, to, try to mimic that somehow. And that means identifying these thresholds, this partition. 
And uh, a natural approach there would be these types of uh, estimate then optimize or explore then commit policies, which means you pass some initial number of observations and then I don't know, randomly assign them and then use uh, the information contained in them to estimate the distribution and then use that as a plugin in the DP recursion and essentially rinse and repeat that. So that's the classical approach if you're looking at something which is just relying on the DP structure. And that raises the, the question, of course, is how sensitive is the DP solution to these types of errors that exist in your estimate of the distribution? So forget about the problem that we're even thinking about here. It's just a basic question. If, if you're uh, looking at a distribution that you're estimating relative to the true distribution, and there is some error there, what type of error, how does that error propagate in the DP? So in particular, this is the, the setup more generically. If you have two distributions or two states of the world, red and blue, and you're designing a, the optimal policy, the DP policy in the red world, and with the tilde on top, the best policy in the blue world, then the typical question would be, what's the loss when you take the red policy and find out that the world is actually blue? And what, what happens then? This is a measure of sensitivity of that, of that solution. And I'll, I'll skip this result uh, because again, I think we're starting to get short on time, but you know, essentially the main message is that uh, there is some sensitivity problem in this particular DP setting that we have in this, um, in this uh, assignment problem. So uh, the reason I'm skipping it because I'm gonna show it numerically in a second if I actually have time. Now, setting aside the DP for that reason, what essentially you would do if you were uh, if you had access to the all the information in hindsight is you would assign based on absolute ranks. So you look at the X's, you arrange all of them, and then the rearrangement lemma says if you can arrange them just based on that arrangement, you can maximize the inner product. So essentially, this assignment policy that I have here from X's to rewards is just using A, A, T as the absolute rank of that observation X, T. So the, this indexing convention is because uh, there's um, the rank, the absolute rank one is the highest. So I need to adjust the reward vector because the rewards are ordered from small to large. So that's the reason for this strange indexing convention. But essentially the intuition is clear, just based on absolute ranks assigned based on order. Of course, this policy is not admissible because you don't know the absolute ranks. You're only seeing the X's one at a time. So the idea would be maybe try to replace that by the relative ranks and use that as a, as a possible uh, mechanism for doing the assignment. The problem, of course, there is that the first observation is going to have rank one, the relative rank one, because you, you haven't seen any other observation. And that biases you in a very significant way. So one possible way to deal with that is to debias it. And that's essentially this policy that I'm showing here. You form an estimator of the absolute rank, which is based on the relative rank, which is observable. And essentially this term here is uh, doing that debiasing that I'm talking about. And then you just do the assignment, the actual assignment of the X to the, rank, to the reward, uh, is going to be done based on plug-in. Just plug this value, this value here, just plug it in as if it's the true absolute rank. And the intuition behind that debiasing is essentially trying to um, account for the fact that initially when T is small, you don't have a lot of information and you need to adjust for that. And as T gets larger, things get more and more accurate and you can quantify that using concentration inequalities. So. Uh, for those of you who teach uh, regression, like me, um, the, one of the concepts we teach in, in basic regression is called adjusted R squared. If you are familiar with the term, it's some notion of penalty for, for not over-parameterizing um, the model or, or for over-parameterizing. And the, actually, the actual concept here is very similar to what you see, what you see there. It's an adjustment for degrees of freedom relative to number of observations. But essentially, the idea is when t is small, you need to bias. Uh, when you get about halfway, the relative ranks become very accurate in terms of predicting absolute ranks due to this concentration. And towards the end of the game, anyway, you're losing all your degrees of freedom. So by accounting for all these error terms, you can come up with this 
funky looking bias term there. Uh, and more importantly, you can show for that simple algorithm, which is essentially using relative ranks, you can get the regret to be um, bounded as follows. So if this class of distributions is containing everything with finite support, like uniform, then the solution you get from that policy is close up to root n, where n is the horizon, is close up to root n to the best offline solution. So you're getting pretty close to that. On a per round basis, you're getting pretty close to, to the best offline solution. And if in addition, you can add this um, uh, density condition, you can actually do even better. You can get this um, logarithmic regret. And these, these values are, um, are essentially best possible. So there exist instances in which no policy can achieve anything, anything better. So that essentially characterizes the minimax regret in this, uh, in this setting. And the interesting thing maybe is not so much these mathematical results on the, um, on the regret and so on. It's more the fact that uh, it shows an, a, a robustness of this class of policies, which is a, a little bit surprising given the simplicity of the policy. And that is probably best illustrated um, numerically. By the way, just as a side note, uh, <clears throat> These uh, these values, the root n and log n, for those of you who work, I've seen papers in multi-arm bandits and other papers in the learning theory literature. This looks very familiar, right? Because this is the, the result for the multi-arm bandit problem uh, when it's um, instance independent, and this is the instance dependent uh, result. This is the essentially the Lie Robbins uh, bound, and this is the Peter Orr and company bound, uh, company bound for the worst case UCB. It turns out that the, uh, the arguments here are actually quite different. So while the results look superficially similar, the underlying logic is actually <clears throat> reasonably different than what you see in the multi-arm bandit problem. So there's potentially some contribution also on the um, machinery that's being used to generate those results. But I think the most interesting thing about these is actually to watch them, wa watch the illustration numerically. And here is an illustration. This is like a picture proof of the, of the theorem, basically, that shows you how this uh, rank-based policy works relative to the MDP. So the MDP here is, knows the distribution and knows it correctly. And this is how the regret, basically, the re regret of that uh, behaves. So you see the MDP and you see the, uh, you see the, the rank-based policy here. Uh, and you see the regret of that. And clearly the rank-based policy is not doing as well as the MDP policy. Uh, and that's due to the fact that it doesn't have access to the, or it has access to the distribution, but there's no way to actually use that information because it, the policy itself is, um, is agnostic. So um, you get a degradation in performance in terms of the regret. However, <clears throat> when you look at the, um, uh, so this, this, sorry, this is another illustration of this. Uh, this essentially, this is the two cases. Uh, one of them is uh, a general case, and one of them is this uniform case where you have um, this density condition, so things behave logarithmically. So this is why the scaling here is done as follows. So think about these as both picture proofs of the theorem, but also showing you the gap that exists between the rank-based policy and the MDP. So if you know the underlying distribution, the MDP solution strictly dominates the rank-based policy, uh, but the rank-based policy still conforms with what we have in that theorem. However, when you look at the pathwise behavior, you can see something interesting. This is the actual assignment of the jobs to workers in our original terminology. And you can see what, in what way does the rank-based policy differ from the MDP policy. So you can see the MDP is much more uh, centered around this diagonal, much more clustered around that, has a much lower variance in its, uh, in its behavior compared to this um, blue rank-based policy, which is more, more spread out. Now, this is in the case where the MDP is designed based on the correct distribution. And when we're looking at pathwise properties of this DP solution, so the conclusion is the DP solution is much more concentrated around the, around the optimal behavior whereas the rank-based policy is more spread out. So we see a partial explanation maybe also for those graphs being degraded relative to the, the earlier regret graph, graphs being degraded relative to the, the DP solution due to this additional spread or variance in that policy. 
However, when you look at this policy now uh, and compare the rank-based policy to the DP policy when the DP policy is designed under an incorrect premise of the distribution, you can see that once the horizon grows beyond this point here, the DP solution essentially exhibits linear regret, as you'd expect, because the solution isn't designed uh, based on the correct distribution, whereas the rank-based policy is pretty well behaved compared to that. So this is this shows that robustness property. On one hand, you have this extra variance that you see in the, that policy, but at the same time, uh, you have this robustness that when the distribution information isn't accurate, the DP uh, performance falters and the rank-based policy performs well. And, and just zeroing in on that, this is essentially the last uh, numerical illustration I have. Here's a case where we're looking at the, um, at the family of beta distributions. And one is the uniform zero one, which is nested within the beta distribution. And what you see here is essentially the DP performance regret wise, uh, when it's designed under the assumption that the underlying distribution is uniform. So in the case where that's correct and the underlying distribution is uniform, if I would blow up this part of the graph, you'd see that there's a big gap between the red and the blue and the blue is better. And the reason for that is because the DP solution is accurately capturing the correct distributional assumptions and performing uh, better than the rank-based policy. However, once you start drifting out left and right, you see this degradation in the blue graph, which is the DP. That's because the DP continues to design based on the uniform, but you're deploying it in an environment which is now not uniform. It's now beta with a suitable parameter, which is different from the assumptions you designed it under. And you can see the degradation is pretty significant, not symmetric, but pretty significant um, in both directions. Whereas you see the, the red graph, which is for the rank-based policy, is pretty much flat. That is, it doesn't matter what the distribution is, uh, it basically performs pretty much the same. There's some variation there, but not, not very significant. So that's that robustness property that I was referring to earlier, which is um, captured theoretically in that minimax uh, result that we have. But this is a better way to even see it in, in the way that it sort of plays a much more important role in showing you that this policy doesn't matter what the actual distribution is will perform uh, will perform very well and that's because it's based on a very simple structure which is this observation on the importance of ranks in this case so I think I'm uh, I'm pretty much I'm now at the hour mark I believe since we started right Neil so it's uh, sort of time to yeah time to wrap up. So just to, I'll give just a few takeaways. So this is uh, again an illustration of some learning theoretic principles in, in a structured OR problem. So we started from the OR solution, which was in the original paper. And uh, I didn't talk much about the sensitivity of the DP solution per se, but as, as you can see numerically, the DP solution is reasonably um, sensitive here, whereas this um, this other policy is fairly fairly robust. Uh, one of the design principles that came up here is the use of these offline benchmarks uh, or best in hindsight benchmarks, which are already revealing into the problem structure and can guide the design of these of these algorithms. Uh, and again, these are these are just a class of problems. Uh, I'm not trying to advocate that these rank based approaches work more broadly, but in these problems, this is an illustration again of um, how you how you rely on problem structure to design more efficient policies. By the way, the policy itself is there's no computational complexity whatsoever because all it does is just calculate this debiased uh, rank estimator. Uh, fairly robust to problem misspecification, and uh, is regret not optimal but like nearly optimal up to constants. Um, so despite the simplicity. So the, the idea in general is to show that these types of phenomena occur in broader problems. Not that I've been able to do that, but that's sort of the general agenda that I'm trying to trying to look at. Um, and these are, I guess, illustrations of that type of um, observation. All right, thank you for 
bearing with me. Uh, and uh, if there's room for questions, I'm happy to take them. But again, the uh, organizers will make the determination whether we have time or don't have time. I, I think we've got time for a few questions. As long as you have our stuff, then I think we do. So for, but first of all, round of applause. Thank you. Um, yeah, and so yeah, open the floors up uh, if anyone's got any questions. I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Uh, so um, the op uh, the offline opt sorry the MDP optimum and the benchmark you use are different, right? So do you know how far they are? Are there any known bounds on the gap between them? Yeah, good. so good. Yeah, great question. So your question is about when you look at the DP solution, and you look at the. Uh, best offline solution, which is this uh, using the, uh, the Hardy yeah. and company rearrangement lemma, what's the gap between those two? So I, all I mentioned earlier, I think, is this inequality, basically, that uh, I forget where it was, but somewhere here. The I bound. Have, yeah. yeah, here. So this is a bound, but how? what's the quality of that, of that bound? So the numerical illustration was supposed to show uh, a little bit of that. So if I now drift uh, forward, uh, to here, what you see here is essentially um, along the the diagonal here is that solution, mm -hmm. uh, the best offline, and you're seeing the DP around that. This is sort of pathwise behavior, not expectation. So you need to, in order to, to you're asking about the gap in expectation, but this at least shows you a flavor of how the DP be, behaves pathwise. And if you take an expectation over that, you can see that the majority of the cases, if you think about the event analysis here, is very close to that diagonal, but there are a few that are basically lurching around that diagonal. I see. Now, I, I'm not aware of a quantification of that of that gap, uh, and it's actually not that immediate to actually see how you quantify it. Um, so in the I, uniform case, do you think it's easy to calculate it explicitly? So I've actually tried to look at it also in the uniform case, and it's not, it's not, let's put it this way. You can, you can compute, but to actually tease out of that something which is a bit more general is difficult to do. Uh, that's, I guess, my point. Uh, so again, in the case of the uniform, almost everything here can be, can be computed. But, you know, having said that, one thing that's actually useful, and it sort of relates to your question, I believe, when you think about implementing these estimate and optimize approaches in, in DP, like suppose you wanted to sequentially do that. So just look at every observation, update your assessment of the distribution, solve the DP and continue doing that. That's a very reasonable approach to follow, but actually analyzing that is, is surprisingly difficult when it comes to actually really pinning down the performance because you get this changes in the underlying distribution that now alter the DP at every step. And it's enough that one observation is a little bit more off and that throws off the, the solution at that step, et cetera. So I found it reasonably difficult to actually try to characterize that, even in the case uh, of, the, of the uniform. So, so that's one of the difficulties here. One of the nice things about these problems is that you don't have uh, a real exploration exploitation trade-off because the problem is, um, it doesn't have that nature. The observations come in passively. You're not actively collecting them. And in an active mm -hmm. collection problem, like an active learning problem, you don't have that structure. It's even more complicated because you have to deal with that. So here we've regressed out that aspect, but even here, like studying this uh, recursive DP application is not, at, at least again, I, I haven't been able to make a lot of progress there. And I think this is exactly related to your question also about this. Uh, about this gap. Okay, great. And the other questions? Can I ask another one? Sure. Yeah, sure I'll see that. So this is a follow up to what you just said. Um, uh, so in bandits, essentially, that's what one is doing, right? Like in UCB or Thompson bounds, um, uh, you're estimating your di distribution again and again, and you're changing your policy. And then there is the whole concentration uh, based technology that enables one to handle that. But in dynamic programming, doing that is much more challenging. But um, off late, there have been uh, regret bounds on MDP, MDPs in the reinforcement learning world. So do you, think, uh, uh, do you think any of that technology can be applied to address the problem that you just mentioned? 
Yeah, there's um, there's a lot of work, by the way, also on on DP sensitivity. So um, mm -hmm. there's you know classical papers in the um, in the I guess it's more in the machine learning community that actually study sensitivity of DP solutions and error propagation and in, in DP, etc. But again, it's like when you actually come to to do the analysis, and here it's not very complicated, as you were alluding to. You can once it's uniform, you can actually even these integral equations are are reasonably doable, but but to actually characterize what happens as a result of perturbations is is somewhat more more tricky Absolutely. when when you do it sequentially when you do it once and for all it's it's easier to get that and there was one result that I sort of glossed over which was a result of that flavor but when you do it sequentially it's much harder to do but you can actually see the effects of that of the full sequential updating versus partial sequential updating when you compare Thompson sampling performance to UCB what happens there? UCB continuously updates the means, but actually doesn't really update the uh, the upper confidence bound. It actually continues to do it on a worst case basis. It continues to think that the underlying distribution is two point masses at the endpoints if it's a finite support distribution. Whereas Thompson sampling essentially continuously updates that and arrives at a more and more refined notion of where the mass of the distribution is concentrated in terms of the posterior. And that's one of the reasons Thompson sampling excels in practice relative to UCB. But there, there, there aren't really any bounds that spell that out because to, to first mm -hmm. order, mm -hmm. we're still seeing something like a root N or, or, or log N type of regret and identifying the constants is pretty difficult. So it's clear that the, there could be a difference of uh, you know, order of magnitude in the constant between UCB and Thompson sampling due to the sort of worst case analysis and not full updating. But, you know, I, I, I'm not aware of work that's been fully able to, to flesh that out. I mean, just the bounds are not refined enough to, to do that. Thanks. Great. Uh, do we have one more question or? Okay. Um, well, okay. So I, I'll say thanks to, to Asaf again, it's great. Thanks again for the invitation to um to present in the seminar. You know, being the last yeah last presenter of the season, like being the the guy who's presenting right before lunch, right? So it's, it's all been leading up with our lives now. It's all, it's, all, it's all been leading up to this moment, Asaf. That's for sure. So I, I wanted to say one more thing. So um obviously I'm I'm grateful to Mariana and Jing and also Yuan Song, but I wanted to say a, a special thank you. Uh, to Siva, uh, who set up the whole seminar during COVID and has been the chair and pretty much running, I mean, we've been helping around the edges, but pretty much running the show since uh, day one. I think uh, it goes without saying from the whole community uh, how grateful we are for all the work that Siva has put in over the last two years organising the seminar. So, you know, uh, if people can turn the unmute themselves and, and just give a quick round of applause to Siva to say thank you, that, that'd be great. So... Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everyone. But um, uh, I mean, I should thank the community who made the seminar series uh, very successful. Most of the speakers that we reach out to have agreed and people show up regularly. Otherwise, the seminar series is not possible without yeah. people's participation. And I personally benefit a lot from the seminar series. And uh, yeah. I, I just want to add my, my two cents. Like, hats off to you guys for this organization and hats off to everybody who's uh, willing to attend the umpteenth uh, Zoom uh, torture session. Uh, I've pretty much had enough with Zoom for a lifetime. And in fact, I think this is the only seminar that I gave on Zoom during, uh, during the pandemic because I basically declined all invitations to give Zoom, Zoom seminars. I was so fed up with Zoom from teaching. So I can only express my personal view that uh, with all the admiration to the Zoom organization, I really hope to see all of you guys in person uh, as opposed to seeing your um, your mug shots on Zoom. <laughs> Hopefully a couple of weeks in Stochastic Networks or somewhere similar like that would be good. Yeah, yeah, so good. Okay, well, and it's not stopping the seminar series. It's still continuing in the next semester, just not with us guys. So, you know, <laughs> so yeah, th thanks, thanks all, cheers. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Okay, right. and I'll just check the YouTube. I'll take the YouTube off just in case. Uh, still on that, I think that's stopped now. But th thanks, Asaf. I yeah, I just wanted to uh, stick around and just say uh, thanks again, Despite Neil, the Zoom. <laughs> yeah, that, that, no, no, of course. You know, I, I just, I was just saying.